I'm gonna film my first vlog in like eight years. And I decided to do it at the world famous Jim Morrison room. This is in LA. I've spent many nights in here. Many, many crazy nights in here. And now, I'm going to film a vlog. Wait, that's my drawing. Oh my God. That's my drawing. <laughs> I am so happy right now, wow. So none of this is, um, like thought out or planned, I'm just gonna completely go off the top. Um, yeah, I wanna share with you what I've been watching on YouTube lately, which is a lot of people's um, recovery stories slash them being honest about what they went through and sharing that. And it's actually helped me immensely. Um, so I wanted to be able to offer something like that and I get a lot of questions every day about what I'm going through and what I was going through. And I think that um, I can use my platform here on YouTube to add to some of that, that place on YouTube that exists that really, really does help people. Um, so whether this gets viewed now or in a hundred fucking years from now, um, I think these are those kind of stories that can actually help other people make better decisions or get through what they're going through if they're going through similar things. Um, so, here it is. Uh, I was living in Minnesota. This is about 10 years ago. Um, I'm 32 now, so let's say, actually, let's go back to when I was 18. Um, 18 years old, I started touring full time. I started touring when I was 16. I started following, touring full time when I was 18 um, with my band called Four Letter Lie. Uh, within Four Letter Lie, that's when I was really, really exposed to tour life. And um, the other guys in my band, honestly, they like didn't even party at all. You know what I'm saying? There, there was, there was two of them that were potheads and. One of them was straight edge. You know what I'm saying? One of them, one of the singers, the singer, the screamer guy in my band was straight edge. Um, and so internally my team and my band wasn't like enticing me to get fucked up. Um, but I was always drawn to chaotic rock stars, man. Like all, the people tatted on my arm, Jimi Hendrix, Miles Davis, Jim Morrison, Frank Sinatra, Janis Joplin, Bob Marley, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Bob Dylan. I mean, all of these people had a really, really big codependency on chaos, I would say, from the outside looking in. And from a very young age, I was attracted to that, to that chaos. And somehow, through being attracted to it, I became one of that, where I was codependent on chaos. And I was searching for outside chaos to be part of. And my band would tour with other bands and I would just hang out with the other bands and find the person within that other band that got the most fucked up and we would just ride it out. Um, at that time, that's when I started drinking a lot of alcohol, like getting fucking drunk. Um, and I really, really at that time before I was 21, I didn't really love getting drunk, I just loved getting fucked up, you know? Like, I just had this desire to always be outside of reality as much as possible. And um, so that, that just by being there all the time became something that I did all the time. Then I turned 20 and tried cocaine. And one of my friends that I made music with like cocaine and I did not, I was like anti-cocaine. I honestly thought it was like, like I judged you if you did it, you know what I'm saying? And then fucking one night in the studio, um, I did a bump and that was it. 
That was it. I became an addict right there. Plain and simple. 19 years old, going on 20. Maybe I was 20 then. Um, it was before I was 21, I became addicted to cocaine. Completely. Um, I didn't have that much money then. I didn't have any money then. I was just starting Mod Sun. This was when I just started Mod Sun. Um, so as much as I love cocaine, it wasn't a problem because I couldn't really get it. Uh, so marijuana, as always, has been there for me. Um, I probably should have started with this, but I first smoked weed when I was six, maybe, no, I want to say 15, 14 or 15, I first smoked weed and, uh, Weed has saved my life completely. Uh, I've been diagnosed with ailments that would say you need to take medication. I've been prescribed a medication and never took it. Um, one of my friends, when I was in the start of, or, or maybe the start of high school, I think, um, one of my friends passed away from pills. That's actually that's the end of high school. The end of my high school, someone, one of my best friends passed away from pills. Uh, he took painkillers and muscle relaxers and, and all that shit and his body got so comfortable that it just forgot to keep working. And uh, that stuck with me. That really stuck with me. So I hated pills. I always hated pills and I hated him even more when he passed away. Um, so weed has been my medication for real long before it was known as medication weed has been my medication and uh, I'm still smoking weed now um, my sobriety consists of no hard drugs and no alcohol wow there's some really cute girls those are high um, no hard drugs no alcohol so back to the story 20 years old got addicted to cocaine didn't have money was actually, was, was broke, dead ass broke. So it didn't become a problem. Um, it just became something that in my head, if, if it was around, I was gonna like do anything I could to do it. Whoever had it, I was like, yo, you're my best friend. What's up? What's good, baby? Um, whew, it was ugly. Then, 22 or 23 hits and I released my first book. And my first book, Did I Ever Wake Up? My one of one of my masterpieces, if not my masterpiece, when it all goes down. Um, that changed my fucking life in so many amazing ways. Um, like I, to be honest, like I became rich overnight off of that. All of a sudden, I went from no money, no bank account to making a lot of money, like more than my mom, off of a book, opening up a bank account with like 60 grand. You know what I'm saying? I opened up a bank account, walked into my local bank account with a $60,000 check, like, hey, can I get a bank account now? Like for real. And uh, and that's when a lot of amazing things started happening. That's where a lot of fucked up things started happening because now I had money and I had the ability to to fulfill my urges at any moment. I was still in Minnesota though. And in Minnesota, I don't know what it's like now, but in Minnesota, um, blow wasn't a thing really. You know, it was very hush hush. I think times have changed a lot in the last 10 years, but um, things were very hush hush. So again, as much as I loved it and loved doing it, and now I had the ability to have it all the time, I was still judgmental about it and, and, and very hidden about it. And so I didn't really know anyone who did it or had it. And uh, and also I, I kept this a secret for 10 years, pretty much. Um, unless you were my really close friend or in the studio with me on a regular basis, like you didn't know I was addicted to drugs. You didn't know. Um, because I didn't share that with the world and I didn't glorify it and I never thought it was cool. I've always thought it was an ugly, ugly drug. Um, and I, and, and it's, more, it's become more of that now, but that being said, uh, all of a sudden I moved to California 
I want to say maybe I was 25 years old. I don't really know all the timeline of this. I was kind of out of it the whole time, but I moved to California. I've been out here now for like five and a half, six years. So about 25 years old, I moved to California. And all of a sudden, I'm literally doing cocaine all the time, every day. Um, I don't, I don't remember how I got connected to someone, but I got connected to the right person who, who made a lot of fucking money off me. You know what I'm saying? Um, I was getting eight balls of cocaine from 25 to 108 days ago. Um, so about six years, I was getting an eight ball every other day. Uh-huh. And uh, and I kept this really, really hidden um, until I realized that when you go out in Hollywood, like, <sighs> I want to say 60% of, of all the people, wherever you are, are probably doing cocaine. That's a low number, too. Like, honestly, it's probably more. Um, and I stopped hiding it as much. And I stopped being so secretive about it and kind of was starting to think like, oh, this is rock star shit. Fuck it, man. Like, I'm a rock star. Let's live this. Cocaine's fucked up. It crosswires your emotions. Um, it makes you think that everyone around you is out to get you. Um, if you think just realistically, as high as you get off something, the, you're gonna get as low off of it. And cocaine would literally provide me with that like 15 minute, like fucking the world is the greatest thing. And 15 minutes later, do it again, the world's the shit. 15 minutes later, do it again, the world is the shit. 15 minutes later, do it again. Then I look back, holy shit, look at all this work I got done. I was like this. I was like, yo guys, like I'm like Wolf of Wall Street on cocaine, man. I'm always working on it. How could it be bad? And I convinced myself of that. And um It really, 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 really fucked up a lot of relationships because I was now, uh, I was doing it so much. I mean, let's just put it, I'm gonna put it in perspective. Like real addicts, like real addicts that I would hang out with or I would be around out here in Hollywood. Um, they would tell me that like I did more blow than anyone they've ever seen in, in that kind of rapid rate. They'd spend three days around me and they would be like, I've never seen someone like party this hard. And I would stay up for three days, three days. Three days, sleep for an entire day, stay up for three days, sleep for an entire day, stay up for three days, sleep for an entire day. That was what I was doing for years. And um, I would be, I'd have drawers in my house, secret drawers that I could go to with no one to know. I would have little stashes next to my bed be laying next to a girl, look over, you know what I'm saying? Um, in my bathroom, under my sink, I'd have a little tray. And, uh, and I was just keeping it going. And the worst part about it was this entire time, uh, my drinking would only become a monster because I would do the age old tale where you get so high on cocaine that when you finally want to go to sleep, you can't. And uh, so you think that the only way to fall asleep is to drink a bunch of whiskey or alcohol, but usually cocaine and whiskey kind of go hand in hand. And I was that guy. I would get as high as I could for two days, three days, and then I would go, fuck, all right. Like, I'm getting like, I feel disgusting and I need to fall asleep because I can wake up and my nose will feel better and my throat will feel better and I won't have this like, it, when, you're, when you're addicted to cocaine and you're about to run out or you run out of it, it 
this feeling inside of your body makes you want to rip your skin off like it makes you feel like i'm claustrophobic and it makes it make it would make me feel claustrophobic in a in the middle of an arena with no one in it that's the kind of shit it would do to me it would make me feel like i was being covered in saran wrap and i couldn't move um so whiskey i would pound a bottle of whiskey every time i wanted to go to sleep you know the 175 like i would pound it the entire thing and if any of y'all have ever seen me play live before like you've probably seen me drink an entire bottle of whiskey on stage because this shit only intensified when i went on tour when i'd go on tour i would be on stage thinking about how i'm gonna score drugs and how I'm gonna be able to go and get fucked up before I do my meet and greet, or try to drink an entire bottle of whiskey on stage in front of people because I thought that was me. Thought that was me, man. And I'm sorry for all that. I am apologetic. Um, I'm unapologetic about the life that I've lived because it's my life, but I am apologetic about the sides of people that I've, the sides of myself that I've shown to people and influenced them on. Um, that's why I want to do this video as a good influence to try to make up for all that shit. <laughs> I'm fucking sorry. So I really do want to, really do want to make up for, um, the things that I've done in front of you and hid from you. Transparency makes me feel really good right now, even though it makes me cry. Um, so, I'm going on for years of cocaine, 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 whiskey, 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 whiskey. Uh, I'm in pretty bad shape. Um, throughout that time, I kind of built this problem with my body that I had because I would go days without eating and look at myself in the mirror like damn you look good and then I'd like eat uh, a sandwich and I'd look at myself immediately after and be like oh my god you're fucking gross and like this up and down of, of losing weight and gaining weight just because I wasn't eating it wasn't because I was looking good or it wasn't because I was working out or it wasn't because my weight was fluctuating because I had some kind of problem. It was literally because I would eat something and the little tiny thing that I would eat would change my mental image of myself to be like, wow, bro, like you're fucking gross. And that became this mental issue within me about my appearance. And um, then I started to think that cocaine, convinced myself that cocaine was like helping my appearance now because I'm getting skinnier. And since a little kid, I've always had this problem with thinking that I'm fucking chubby. And, you know, like I would wear my shirt into the swimming pool when I was a kid. I was that kid. I was very self-conscious. And usually the people that that display themselves as the most unself-conscious could be the most, usually. And so you see me cover myself with tattoos and you see me be shirtless all the time. That's usually because I'm hiding the fact that I just want to compliment so bad to to override this idea in my head of myself, I think. Um, so all these problems were happening and I didn't want anyone to know that I was an addict. And now I was screaming from the top of the fucking buildings because I'm out of that headspace where you're afraid of what you are. And my family has a issue with alcohol i shouldn't say my family but um within my parental system there is problems with alcohol and there's problems with depression and my entire life i've just been running from the thought of becoming what is in my dna um i never wanted to become an addict or become an alcoholic as much as I loved chaos, I loved being a peer person doing good. Um, but I got fucking lost and my wires got crossed. 
songwriter. <laughs> oh, so there I was. Um, maybe let's say 27, the year that pretty much everyone on my arm tattoo died on. Uh, I was pretty sure that I was going to be a part of that. And I made a deal with myself when I was 27. And I was like, if I live through this year, I'm going to put down the drugs. I didn't think liquor was a problem at this point. So I was just concerned about putting down the drugs. And I lived through 27. And I didn't fucking hold up that deal because I was weak as fuck at that point. And, uh, and I was showing the world how strong of a person I am. That I couldn't show signs of weakness. This is what my mindset was. Um, now at 27, I got into my first real relationship since like high school. Um, started dating this girl and uh, and we like real relationship it, you know? We got a house together and we started living together. And this was like a dream girl of mine and I didn't want to disappoint her. And um, instead I ended up fucking destroying everything and hurting her and putting her through fucking mental misery um, because I was hiding my addiction heavily. Um, I didn't want anyone to know that I had a problem that I couldn't overcome. I wanted everyone around me to think like, I'm the happiest person in the world, I'm the most positive, I'm the strongest, I'm the funniest, I'm the most inspirational, I can make anything happen I'm at everyone's disposal for making them feel better. Um, that's what I wanted the world to think of me. I wanted them to think that I was a superhero. And uh, and I destroyed that relationship. And that girl stuck with me through a lot of bullshit. Like, I put her through a lot of bullshit because I was, um, I was not ready to put myself at the top of someone. It was still all about me. And uh, to that girl out there, I fucking love you. And I'm sorry about that shit. Um, since then we've actually since since i've gotten sober we've actually um spoke and she's like forgiving me and that's a part of recovery is forgiving yourself and asking forgiveness and so anyone out there maybe this is my first tip in there um that's one of the biggest parts that'll make you want to overcome something is asking forgiveness and forgiving yourself so Keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, I destroyed that relationship. I was living at that time. We moved to uh, right off Sunset Boulevard. That's when my addiction became full throttle. Um, I was on Sunset Boulevard. I could get any dealer to stop at my house at any time. Um, I could go out and stumble down Hollywood and I would go out at one saying I was gonna go stop somewhere for a drink and I wouldn't be back till 5 a.m. Uh, that became like a thing. Uh, so many things happened that ruined that relationship, but one of them for sure was my addiction problems. Uh, I was mentally and emotionally fucked up and fucking with other people. Like, I was manipulating people. My worst fucking trait is I'm a master manipulator. And I use it, I was using it for bad so many times, which is something that I picked up from my father. You know, he's a master manipulator. He's a hustler. And I got that from him. But, like, that's my biggest thing that I have to avoid is I try my best to never manipulate anymore, you know? Because manipulation is usually a false version of the truth it's not like a lie but it's like using people men trying to outwit them to get them to do what you want it's fucked up and i did that 
she moved out of that house and I stayed there. We broke up, she moved out and I stayed there. And now I'm in this giant fucking mansion by myself um, on Sunset Boulevard. And next door to Jim Morrison's house. That's why I moved there, by the way. Shout out Jim Morrison. Like he lived over there in Laurel Canyon and we moved next door to his house. Um, again, my desire for fucking chaos. Like Jim Morrison's story is chaos. Um, and that's what I wanted. So we moved there so I could pretend like I was fucking him. <laughs> and then I became a version of him. I felt like he creeped into my soul. And, uh, and I was so happy. I was so happy because I felt like I was a fucking true rock star, like gonna be written in the stars next to them, you know? Um, so I just isolated and took my drugs to a whole other level. My relationship got, the, the relationship, the void that my relationship left got filled completely with drugs. Um, I was doing as much drugs as I could because I had no one to hide it from. Um, you know, when you go through a breakup, like you lash out and you do, you know what I'm saying? Bounce back shit. So I'm out there on Hollywood Boulevard by myself. But like, this is embarrassing people like trashed, completely blackout drunk, eight ball of cocaine in my pocket, high as fuck, um, in leather pants, no shirt on boots, walking down sunset at 3 a.m. Like, this is like 20, this is like, you know, three or four years ago. So like, I wasn't known, like I wasn't unknown, you know what I'm saying? And this, this was a bad look and I'm so lucky that I never got like, I'm grateful that I never got, well, maybe I'm not grateful, but I never really got called out on it. No one was ever like, cause I kind of just was playing that role, I guess. And people, I, I thought people wanted that. And so I'm stumbling around looking like fucking insane. Whew. Um, so then fast forward, fast forward, uh, I move out of that house. I move as far away from my, from sunset as I can, because this is me. This is my way of saying that, like, I will be able to quit if I change my environment, you know? So get off of sunset. I move out to Woodland Hills, which is like a 40 minute drive from sunset out in the mountains. Reminded me of Minnesota. I was like, I'm going to get wholesome again. Um, addiction's a crazy motherfucker. Hell no, my addiction's sitting there the whole time talking to me like this. Like the good me is like, change your environment, get out, move far away. And then my addiction's over here like, bro, like, <sighs> how are the dealers gonna get out here? So now you, 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 you better buy a ton. You better buy a ton when you see your dealer because they're not gonna be just pulling out here to Woodland Hill. That's when I started spending like $800 to $1,000 at a time when I saw my cocaine dealer. And thinking, thinking that that was going to make me be able to like ration it. No, no, fuck no. Money is the number one thing that will fucking kill a drug addict. So now I have a tile and you can ask my homies like, my homies are not proud to, to know that they couldn't, because I wouldn't listen. I wouldn't listen. My family couldn't help me. My friends couldn't help me. I wouldn't listen to anyone because at that point, it became a big problem. Like, my my lawyer um, was speaking to my man, JL, just like on the daily, like, yo, he needs to go to rehab. He needs to go to rehab. Like, he's fucked up. And uh, I would have a tile. I went to Home Depot. It's so fucking ridiculous I am. I went to Home Depot and bought this marble tile, just one tile, like a marble tile. It's like super expensive marble tile. And my, you can like, my homies will back this up. It's very disgustingly ugly, but there would be a Mount Everest pile of cocaine. I'm talking like this, this high up, okay. This high off the tile, like this, cocaine. Just out, just out. Just out, just out on my counter. Cause no one was coming out to Woodland Hills. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then uh, something with my 
um, father happened that threw me into a spiral, a complete spiral. Um, and this is not, this is not to point blame at all. I hope it doesn't sound like that, but I went through something personally that fucking threw me into a chaotic whirlwind of thinking about death every day. Thinking about death every day from, I wanna say like 29 years old to 32 years old was thinking about death every single day. You know, I've written more than three wills in that period of time. Um, and uh, I've shared the story. If you go watch the trailer for The Happiest Show on television, um, I shared the story about what happened with my father and I really don't want to I was on I was on drugs when I shared that story and I'm not absolutely 100% proud of myself for sharing that story. So father, if you're watching this, I hope you know I apologize for putting you out there like that. Um, I am proud of overcoming and I do think that by sharing the story it did help me. So if anything, please forgive me for putting you out there like that, but please understand it did help me. Um, threw me into a mental whirlwind. whirlwind and uh, that stuck with me for the last three years. Um, again, I thought that changing my life up would help me to stop doing drugs. Um, shortly after the thing with my father happened, uh, my team had like a very internal, um, it's time to make a change with him. He's gonna kill himself. And they all kind of came together. And uh, I slowly started to go into a recovery system of um, getting better. Really, I was just lying to them. I never slowed down. I never. And, and my team that's watching this, I apologize to all of you. Um, my lawyer, my brothers, uh, you know, I lied to you guys. I, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm cleaning up. And I was just secretly always getting fucked up. And then I got into my last relationship and I swore this was gonna be my fresh start and the one pivotal thing to help me make a change in my life. Uh, and we, I moved out of that house. And before that, I, was, I moved out of my house thinking I was gonna be able to get another house really easily and I didn't. And so I started living in my warehouse, which was a office, literally for a month living in a warehouse. Just, that's when I started to experiment with different kinds of drugs, with ketamine, with, lot there i mean i've always been experimental with drugs i'm not gonna i'm not saying cocaine was the only drug i was doing i was always always experimenting with mushrooms acid molly ecstasy um i'm gonna and i'm about to get to you the final drug that i experimented with that really threw me into hell um so i thought this was gonna be my fresh start and we moved into this house together um, and I, I was doing really, really good. Uh, I wanna say that I pretty much gave up cocaine for like the first couple months of our relationship because I knew that um, the person I was with was not a fan of that. And um, as, as unjudgmental as she was, uh, she did mean the world to me and I didn't wanna let her down. Um, so I was very good for the first couple months and I was so high off of our love that honestly it filled that void anyway. Um, I was high off love, man, for real. Like really, truly fucking 100% in love, in love, in love enough to be able to put the drugs down. Um, but that didn't last. And I started, you know, sneaking it in anywhere I could get it. You know, it started with we're, we're at a party and someone had it and i was like yo babe can i do something and she was like i don't care like whatever if, if that's what you want to do and i was like word cool and fucking did it and then boom it just reignited me and i was like fuck 
Um, and then I started hiding it and I did the exact same thing again. I had stashes by my bed, I had stashes in the bathroom, I had stashes in drawers. Um, I would stay up in the studio and when I'm in the studio working, I'd be by myself and um, I would be able to just sit there and, and lie and not say I was doing cocaine because I could hide it so well. Um, but then I started to experiment with something that really, really is fucking awful. Um, and I started drinking lean, codeine, um, really fucking good codeine and getting the pints that are fucking expensive, just to be honest. We're talking like a thousand dollars for a fucking pint. Um, and I was going through those, like, I don't know how other people drink lean. Cause I feel like it's, for me, it was like a, a, a solo like thing. Um, but I have to think I was drinking a lot more than other people, you know? Cause I spent about, I don't even want to talk about the money I spent on that shit. Um, but I'll never forget when a doctor came into my house unexpectedly and saw these bottles of lean by my bed. There was like six pints by my bed just sitting there. I think all of them were empty. And this was within a month or less, three weeks, two weeks. And he was just like, that's not okay. He literally, and this this person wasn't there for me. He was literally like, that's not okay. Like, you are gonna die, okay? That's not okay. Like, scolding me, bad boy. And, um, and I didn't even have the fucking common sense. I'm the older one here um, in, the, in the relationship I was in, and I was a, clearly a, a fucking bad influence right there um, to have that around, you know? Um, and I got addicted to that shit. And that shit really, really affected me in that way that like dope does, you know? You're just like strung out. And when you sit lean, you basically wake up the next day still high from it. And uh, it also made me gain weight, you know? It made me gain a lot of fucking weight because that shit does that to you. And I, I, I honestly, I honestly just think that, you know, there's a reason that liquor tastes bad, right? There's a reason that whiskey doesn't taste like fucking Kool-Aid because that shit would kill you so quick. And codeine, that shit is like candy and it's the scariest of it, it's probably it's top tier the scariest drugs that are in this world right now to me um because it is so so easy to drink um all this all this accumulated to the moment in my life where i had to look back and realize that i kind of destroyed everything good for me that I had going. I would get very close to the finish line of something and then my codependency on chaos would snap in and I would self-sabotage myself. And I lost a lot of friends, lost a lot of relationships. I've had nothing but back and forth problems with my family Drugs really affected my life. Drugs really, really, really hurt me and slowed me down and turned me into a person that I didn't want to be. And the feeling that they provided will never ever amount to the feeling that I get when I'm being honest with the world. And that's what's happening right now while I'm sharing this with you. Um, I'm looking at all the mistakes I made and I'm owning up to them and I'm sharing my story with you 
um, I don't want to give you all some fluff piece and make it seem anything but real to you. Um, this shit will, it'll fuck your life up. All the drugs that I just named in here, you know, I just urge you all, make your own decisions and choices, but please base them off of the stories of experience that people have gone through. And that's what this world is all about, is about sharing your experiences so that you can make this place a better world. And as I look out this window and see all these people walking by, the only thing I can think is that if I could just reach any of these people, just one of them, then everything I went through is perfectly how it should be. But if I don't try to reach people and help them, then all of this was for nothing. <laughs> and I truly believe that this is all, that this is all exactly as it should be. This is my movie and this pain and this suffering that I'm going through um, will be gone one day. And I'll be able to watch this video and know that I did my best to tell the world who I was and how I'm going to get better. Just take it one day at a time. Be transparent with people and allow yourself, allow yourself to have a fucking chance at a future, man. Ah, I'm so lonely and and confused right now, but I know that this is not going to be this is not gonna be the end, you know? This isn't the end. It's time to start again. I hope this can help someone out there. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Before I leave, if anyone ever wants to come here to the Jim Morrison room where I just uh, did this little vlog, it's right out here in Hollywood. Come see my people. Come here. Come here. Sydney, come here. Hey. Give me hey. 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 Hey, love you too. Um, okay, so I just got back from the Jim Morrison room uh, to my beautiful house with my beautiful dogs. Uh, out of respect for being in the Jim Morrison room, uh, I didn't get to say this final part that I really want to say. Um, I think it's really important to, uh, that the message and the tone of this video is um, A, to help, and B, to really be careful about the people that influence you in your life. Um, you know, 95% of my idols, my heroes, died of drug overdoses and that just inherently became th something sorry something that i got into so uh i want to be someone that promotes the opposite of that which is um being very aware of your mental health and your life wanting to live a long life you know so to all my idols that did pass away, I want to be an example of someone who learned from them 
uh, not to make the same mistakes. And by me doing this, I feel like I'm maybe tapping into that and giving you a way to potentially save yourself from making the same mistakes. Um, also a big part of recovery is being grateful. And as much as all of that was a separate story from what I'm about to say, I am extremely grateful for everything I've gone through. I'm extremely grateful to be where I'm at in life. I'm extremely grateful for all my blessings and for all of you. Uh, Y'all have been my biggest support system. I am about to hit 110 days clean of hard drugs and alcohol. Uh, I go to AA meetings, I go to therapy, um, and I'm using social media as a part of that therapy as well to be the most transparent and vulnerable that I possibly can with you guys. Uh, so that was the last thing that I wanted to add to this video. Um, I tried to go over the last like 10 years of my life in a very little amount of time. So I hope that it all digests. I obviously didn't get to say everything that I wanted to say. Um, but I love you all. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, remember me like this. All right. <laughs>